Uh, welcome to the archive, uh, Dr. Irving Finkel. How are you doing today? Fine, glad to see you. I'm sorry I don't have a hat, but... Uh, <laughs> no worries, no worries. I'm always the, the man with the top hat to keep things entertaining. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very glad to, to have you on, um, even though we were just talking about this a second ago. Um, so one of the very first uh, civilizations uh, uh, you were just telling me about uh, called Sumer, or for uh, most people would probably know as Sumeria, uh, is a kind of history that I have very much wanted to uh, cover and go in depth on. Um, okay. So uh, can, we, can we begin uh, starting with the name? Yes. Well, um, what we're talking about is the um, ancient culture of Mesopotamia. So you've got the modern land of Iraq and you have the Euphrates and Tigris rivers in modern Iraq. And the space between them was called by the Greeks Mesopotamia or ancient Mesopotamia. So if you've ever heard that word, that's what it means. It's the old form of Iraq. And in ancient times, um, as far back as we can tell, um, people have lived there because the rivers provided so much fertility for growing crops and everything that goes with it. And the whole land of Mesopotamia, you have um, the north and the Babylonians in the south. So it's a bit like England and Scotland. They both had the same language, which we call Babylonian or Akkadian. So the, the um, Assyrians up in the north of Iraq and the Babylonians down in the south, they could easily talk to one another. It was the same language, but with some difficulties. But before the Babylonian language, there was a language called Sumerian. And these are the older people. We don't know when they arrived in Mesopotamia. It was probably... It, well, it might, it's probably sometime in the uh, fifth millennium or fourth millennium, sometime a long, long, long time ago. And we can't really say anything about them until the writing appears. But and the thing about the Sumerians is they lived between the rivers, in, in mostly in the southern part of Iraq, the Sumerians. They um, had a very sophisticated and um, complex society in many ways. And one of the things which came out of it was the first... Um, form of writing, as far as we know, from archaeology. So it may be that there were other things in the ground, or are other things in the ground, that sooner or later will come to light. But on the basis of what we know now, the first kind of writing invented by human beings was the writing invented by the Sumerians. And it was certainly, things were going on in that area by 3500 BC. Um, a lot of information about them because uh, excavations have gone on by, by archaeologists in that part of the world since the um, early part of the 19th century and all the way through the 20th and even today there are excavations going on. So lots of um, ancient documents have come to light written by the Sumerians or the Assyrians or the Babylonians because they all use the same kind of writing. It's rather extraordinary. If you've never seen this cuneiform before, they wrote it on pieces of clay and they pressed a kind of writing stick like a chopstick into the clay to make marks at different angles. And these marks had the sounds of words and they could then write down words. And after a while, they could write down sentences and then literature and hymns and jokes and all sorts of other things as well. So by 3000 BC, there were people in Mesopotamia who were, so to speak, professional scribes. So they knew how to do all the writing they needed. And if the king had a message or wanted a record or they had to pay out wages or all those sorts of things that required records, they could do it with these pieces of clay and their chopstick making of the signs. And what's extraordinary about it is that um, all these documents survive in the ground. Because although they're very ancient, it's a funny thing about this clay material that when it gets buried, either intentionally or accidentally, it just survives in the ground. So if they'd all done writing on bits of paper or they'd invented paper, say, or if they had wrote on wood or skin, which people have done in many parts of the world, we'd have nothing at all surviving. But clay survives marvellously. So people like me who work on these things with these languages and these cultures we have 
you know, thousands and thousands of documents. It's quite remarkable. Amazing. So you called it a Canaan form of writing? Uh, yeah, cuneiform. It, 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 the reason we call it cuneiform is because in the 19th century, everybody knew their Latin. And um, when you look at cuneiform writing, you can see that you have little wedge shapes pressed into the clay in different positions. So sometimes there are only two wedges in one sign. They might be 13 or 14 in a more complicated sign. But each time the chopstick was applied to the surface, it made a sort of wedge impression. And because they knew their Latin, in Latin, the word for wedge is cuneus. And so they decided to call the writing cuneiform, which means made up of wedge shaped things. So that's how the name got into the world. And um, lots of people uh, never see a cuneiform tablet, but people have heard of the word because people often say to me, oh, you mean that ancient writing or something like that? So often it rings a bell in people's heads. But uh, it, the, the more they know about it, the better, because, as I say, it's the oldest writing and we have lots of wonderful literature, not just um, legal things or letters or administration, but we have stories and um, um, proverbs and myths and um, and poetry and all sorts of things which survive on these funny bits of clay and because it was deciphered and that's a big marvelous achievement that in the 19th century when they first dug these things up no one knew what they were they just thought they were decorative things or something like that and then they began to see by looking at them that they must be a kind of writing and eventually uh, some very clever persons found the secret to how it worked they managed to decipher the cuneiform writing by using um, a long inscription in cuneiform writing where there was a translation into another kind of writing which they understood so they could use that as a kind of window to go from the known to the unknown and if you've ever read anything about egyptian writing the hieroglyphic writing that was also deciphered in the same way because nobody had any idea about it and then they found a text in greek a greek translation of the egyptian text so they used that to open up the egyptian writing so there were a few people in the 19th century who were colossally clever and very determined to to, to penetrate this marvelous resource and then when they when they found the key in each case of a translation that they could read the translation of, then eventually, eventually they prized it open like that. It was a really brilliant achievement. That's incredible. Mm -mm. It is incredible. It's an exciting thing. I mean, sometimes you see it in books for kids about great discoveries, that inventions and that sort of thing. It was one of those major intellectual achievements. Um, by very determined people. But when they did it, you see, what happened was, once they could actually read these inscriptions and translate them into English or French or German or something, uh, they suddenly realised that they had a whole um, a channel of, 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 of human ideas and words and fears and things they were proud of and things when they told lies and things when they told the truth. You could see the whole of the civilization so to speak, from what they've written down in a way that had never happened before. Because the same thing happened with, for example, Latin or Greek, because they were people who excavated in Italy and Greece. They found remains of buildings and pottery and objects, and they found inscriptions. And when they read the papyri in Latin, so the world of the Romans came and they had plays and drama and poetry and philosophy. So with ancient... Um, the ancient Romans and the ancient Greeks, there was lots of writing and lots of people who could read those languages. But when it came to the cuneiform stuff from Mesopotamia, it all had to be created from scratch. And then only a few people have ever done this kind of work. So there in the British Museum, we have 130,000 pieces of clay with writing on and not enough people to study it. So that's the situation. Yeah.
So what are some of the things that we're able to see with these people? Um, did they have like a form of astrology? Like what plays were, like what were they writing about their plays? Did they use magic? They, they use writing for most of the areas that you would imagine if you made a list. So on the one hand, you have lots of administration and legal things and sometimes legal disputes and things about buying and selling things and inheritance and um, selling houses and selling and buying slaves, all those sorts of everyday things. There are lots of documents. And when you would see one, you have no idea what it's about. But when you read it, you discover that all the people who were responsible for those sorts of things, they were careful to when they drew up that this, this was the, for example, selling a house, this is the, where it is, it's located here between this and this and this, it measures this in this direction and this, and the price is this, and, and it's being paid by so-and-so, son of so-and-so to the owner, Mr. So-and-so, son of so-and-so, and it's witnessed by everybody. So you have a piece of clay about the size of a box of cigarettes, so to speak, which has on it all the details and the witness, the name of the witnesses. So if there's ever an argument, if the bloke says, oh, you never paid the money, you know, you never did. I know you never did. Well, they produced this document and all those people were there. Now, oh, yes, I saw it. I was there. So the legal documents, although they look very peculiar, when you read them, you see that they are drawn up with a very great deal of intellectual clarity and experience and with the idea of making sure that nobody slipped round the edge and got away with anything. So that's one whole category of documents. But then, as you say, we have astrology. So we have proper astronomy, which is one thing, especially the Babylonians were very um, interested in this. So that there was astronomy where they studied the heavens and the movements of the planets and they wrote down when they could first see them and last see them and they did it over many generations and eventually they had this fantastic data and they understood quite a lot they could predict for example when an eclipse was coming up that sort of thing so that's proper astronomy and astrology at the same time because they thought that the planets had an effect on people's lives and when a baby was born they made took a lot of pains to see what the situation was in the heavens at the moment of birth, what it predicted for the person. And they tried to propitiate the gods with offerings and sacrifices for good luck and for and they wore amulets for this kind of purpose. So astronomy and astrology, yes. And then they had medicine and magic, those two principles, which to a modern person are completely different, or at least to most modern people, they're quite, quite different. But in fact, in antiquity, they were rather related one to the other. So they believed that when people were ill, it's because something got into you, some kind of malevolent demon or a ghost sometimes, all those sorts of things. And they had to be driven out. And there were rituals to get rid of them and magical spells and magic words. And and you, if you were sick with a fever, they had plant-based drugs, which you apply or internally or externally so there were doctors who had um, big and extensive plant familiarity they knew what plants were good for what things and they wrote these all down in big compilations or medical prescriptions and they arranged them from head to foot so that um, if you had the whole lot you didn't have to read everything to try and find something that you knew it was something to do with an earache you go to the head section and you look through and they had recipes, some of them very old, some of them they got from different parts of um, other, other countries they'd heard about and they tried things out and they were very systematic. So a modern doctor who perhaps sat down and read a translation of one of these medical things would be astonished at the, at the tidy organisation and the fact that um, the, the drugs and plants were described and the measurements sometimes given and how you apply them and things that you have to say at the same time. And some of the magic is magical in the sense that, for example, you might have a piece of coloured string with knots in it to wear around your wrist and that would be a good thing, but you'd have to do other things with it. And so we know a lot about all that. And one of the things about the people who looked after other people, the healers, so to speak, was that um, they were very good at looking at people and observing 
from their appearance what might be wrong with them. So the, the long list, if a person has this um, characteristic thing or this char that characteristic thing, what it might mean or how you could analyze it. And this is something that doctors used to do a long time ago in our world. When, when a doctor, if you were ill, a doctor would come to your house and um, with his bag and sit down on the end of the bed and say, I'd look at the patient carefully and look in their eyes and look at them. And, oh, I think I know what's wrong with you. I've seen this before. And they had that kind of similar idea. And probably it was very reassuring to um, patients because when the doctor looks at you and says, oh, I know what's wrong with you, young man. We need to do this, this and this. Then you feel you're going to get better straight away. It's a rather good thing. But now the observation of the doctor is a secondary matter because there are all sorts of other things they do instead but that actual contact is not something people experience anymore but i think for most of the history of the world that was the primary way in which a patient who was ill and a person who could offer healing met it was in an intimate kind of face-to-face -face thing and probably it was very beneficial and then we have things like mathematical stuff we have letters we have poetry some of the poetry is quite famous, or you might not call it poetry, but for example, the story about Gilgamesh, where the hunt for immortality and the friendship with him and his friends and what, what happened to them and the adventures of it and the flood story and all those things. There's a big, long Hollywood kind of epic with 12 tablets, with all sorts of adventures in it. And Gilgamesh is the superhero who um, who's career is followed and in antiquity those stories had the same power as the same sort of thing does in our modern world you know because everyone was interested and when the human heroes had to deal with their enemies and they had the gods on their side this was very inspiring so when you look at these things you can think oh they're dead they're boring they're a bit like homer or something in greek but when you imagine sitting around a fire in a small village and a storyteller coming who knew these stories by heart and sitting down in the dark and telling this whole narrative and sparks flying on the logs people will be hypnotized by it it was very very powerful so we we have these things where you can kind of taste the the feeling of life and um what happened and my impression is that the ancient populations of the land between the rivers, ancient Mesopotamia, that the people there may have looked quite different in terms of their clothing and they may have eaten different things and they had a religion with lots and lots and lots of gods, not just one or um, that kind of thing. And they had their differences from modern life. But the, the person inside, the Homo sapiens, is the same as the Homo sapiens today. I think it's a, it's a very familiar person that you meet across thousands of years and in this funny clay the, the voices that come out i think are understandable as fellow human beings so that's an important matter because with museums when things are in cases and silent and sometimes when people write books about antiquity they don't make any effort to show that the people who use them were not only alive that's obvious but also were not strangers in the sense that they came from the moon or venus you know you might have or robots or something like that they are fellow human beings and they were frightened of illness and they were frightened of floods and fire and they all wanted to have lots of children and they didn't want to die and they didn't want to go in the army and they they were happy when the gods looked after them and everything was flourishing and their lambs were born and everything when they weren't they were very miserable and they tried to find out what they'd done wrong and everything so they're all very mortal and very um, reasonable. And there were people who were yeah. very traders, you know, they were... They were very much like us. They were, I think, they were like us. This, to me, is a guiding principle about looking backwards down a telescope into ancient times and trying to get some idea of the people. If you don't have any writing, like if you just have archaeological material, it's impossible you have houses you have rooms you have pots you have jewelry you have all those things and, and almost all people have more or less the same sort of things like that not always but almost so 
with archaeology, you can go so far that you can't capture anything of the minds of the people. And when you have writing, if they've been dead for 5,000 years, you can sometimes, as it were, dial them up on the telephone and listen to them talking. It's a very exciting and very wonderful thing, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's like listening to uh, some of uh, Thomas Edison's very early recordings. Exactly that. Exactly voice. that. Yeah. And, and that is an exciting thing even for us to hear today, isn't it? When you want yes. and all that stuff and yeah. the voice comes out. It's incredible. Yes. But it's like that a million times more. So um, one of the things is, I mean, in America, um, th there are some good, strong universities where people study this kind of thing. For example, in Harvard and Yale and in Chicago and Philadelphia, um, there's about six or seven universities where they have a long tradition of studying ancient languages like Egyptian and Babylonian and Sumerian and the, the reason I'm mentioning this is if if you anybody watches you or listens to what the, what this is about or they they hear something about it and they get interested um th that you can do this kind of thing at university and often kids um, when they go to university they don't know what to do they go to university to get away from their parents for one thing and they get away and they do they study something that they're either very good at already or they think they'll get rich if they do it all those kind of rubbishy things but actually the reason to go to university is to study something you find really interesting and the point about it which is so significant is it's the only time in your life when you can do that because you can't do it when you're a kid and when you get grown up if you have a mortgage and kids forget it you never have time to do anything at all and that period of time when you go to university is not just to get drunk and lie around you can actually really learn something and sometimes the people don't have any idea that you can do things at university like this but if you if you are interested or if any, anybody is interested it's worth finding out because it's like this you get a key to a, a kind of door that opens up and there's all these marvelous things that uh, most people know nothing about that they think they're hidden and they're gone forever where you can walk among them and as it were talk to them it's very wonderful yeah and is there other ways too people could find a way to help bring history alive or come become more interactive with with history and with this history too well there are lots of ways um one of them is by giving talks and um, to people. I mean, the British Museum, for example, we do quite a lot of things on YouTube because um, YouTube is a very good way to meet people and tell them about things in museums when they don't go to a museum. They don't know what they are. It never occurs to them and they don't know anything about it. And lots of my colleagues do this. We make a quarter of an hour, or half an hour, sometimes longer talk about an object or why we have it what it means what you can tell about it and they're very popular these things they're called sometimes curators corner and they're very popular because when you look at the comments it's funny sometimes people say oh i never believed that curators in museums were alive or or i never know it could be interesting in a museum because people associate it with being dragged there when they were a kid or I don't know what, um, maybe taken from school and had to write essays about things. But actually, that's one way. YouTube is a modern way of doing what you asked. I mean, you can reach people, you know, and sometimes people cruise around looking for something to watch and look at something for two minutes and think, hey, that's interesting. And then they, because the, it's amazing what is available. You can find out how to do anything in the world with it. I mean, there's no doubt about it that the good side of the internet is astonishing. It is truly astonishing. And it's literally how I found you. Yes, <laughs> one of your, one of your so. amazing yes. one-hour-long lectures. You did well, an amazing. incredible job on uh, Sumerian magic. Uh, oh, yeah. I am going to leave in the description for people to check out because right. I think more people need to watch it. Um, and the, the, uh, you did a great job it. explaining to uh, the spiritual beliefs of the ancient of these ancient peoples. Yeah. Uh, my favorite, too, is when you show the lead tablet of Pazuzu. Oh, yes. An incredibly yeah. beautiful, beautiful uh, piece of art. I, I, I would keep in my house. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Well, that, um, yeah, there, there are, um, you can buy replicas of them sometimes. I don't think they work so well if it's a replica. 
but yes. that's a very encouraging thing because people don't read books so much as they used to you know um they read um, thrillers and light-hearted stuff on the beach and they they might read about politics and history but on the whole um the people don't read as much i think as they used to and this is the modern equivalent of it so i think it's a good way to um to reach people and make you think hey that i never knew about that that's quite interesting and that that's the essence of it all really isn't it just to just to pique someone's interest and show them yeah yeah that's why i started this let's talk to yeah. historians let's talk to people that yeah. live through history it's yeah let's talk about idea. it it's a very good idea you know um uh, um sometimes uh people do animations of things which are um, very effective you know those asterisk books the yes. french books about the caveman and all, and all that the romans i mean and, and all that well those, those books were um very funny and very original at the time and so, so, sometimes people make cartoons of them and they're very absorbing because um animations and cartoons don't have to be goofy and stupid they can actually be um, written by written in order to make things interesting which are real as opposed to interesting which are not real so this is another medium for doing it that, that, that kind of activity so yeah. do, do you, you so tell me about what you do then with this this situation you just get hold of people and ask them questions and then you s disseminate stuff it's a good idea i think it's a good idea thank you thank you yeah it's been a, it's so far it's been a good idea i've had um so five times now uh i've had on uh, one guy in london uh john f white and on youtube he has a channel called crack and forward and he does phylogenetics right. where he takes uh where he programs ai to translate and find certain commonalities in myths so he can try and figure out uh how cultural interaction and cultural evolution changed myths over time and it is to hopefully one day find the world's first story, um, which I am not even going to try and explain further because I'm not of that brain. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm just the guy I'm just the guy with the fancy hat. Um, and then uh, for the third time recently, I just had my friend Philip uh Kairichi on and uh we we first talked about the wild west here in america the second time we talked about edwardian fashion uh in uh, the edwardian era and now um uh soon to be released is going to be how american history in the 1800s helped create uh christmas as to what it is today uh -huh. yes and uh there, there's a number of other uh, a long list of other people i've interviewed um over in england i've interviewed dr eleanor yanaga on the medieval era and all the quirky weird fun things to hear about during that time period <laughs> um yeah it's a very interesting time and then i have interviewed uh people it was it was actually the start of which uh because there's a gentleman by the name of chick mcdougall he was 89. I was working at a TV station and I had a plot to try and trap him in the TV station one day and uh, get all the stories about town on camera. Right. Um, and I constructed this whole documentary on the town's brass band, which is America's op oldest operating brass band. The Exeter New Hampshire brass band is 200 years old. And he died like a week before I was able to get it started. Right. So that made me decide, all right, people that are uh, ages of 65 and older, uh, or lived through Good these old. events. Let's find them. Let's talk to them. And then Good one old. day I ended up interviewing somebody who has a beautiful obsession with Norse history and that opened up Pandora's box for a number of other bad decisions. Yes. Now I'm here talking about the first civilization with Dr. Irving Finkel. Because it might not be the first civilization. We don't really know. It's the first writing we've got. But people might have lived in a very civilized way a long time before that, because, um, for example, there is a site in Turkey called um, Kudepe Tepe, where um, they had major, major, massive stone temples and um, complex structures and complex art about 8000 BC and or even older sometimes, maybe even 9000 BC. 
and they've only recently been excavated. And it changes our picture because whoever did that work, whoever lived there, was very, very organized in the fact, in the sense that there must have been somebody in charge who conceived of and planned out these buildings and got people to bring the materials and to do it about 9000 BC on a huge scale. It's like a town. And that is a, probably as good an example of, of um, civilization, so to speak, as you'll find. If everyone collaborates, there were certainly temples, they certainly had a strongly developed sense of religion. And as central authority, people collaborating together and over a long period of time, this was a civilization for sure. So this is 6,000 years or so before the Sumerian writing was invented. So that means that what happened in between, we don't know anything about it. So the first civilization, who knows how how you define it is one thing, but however you define it, this excavation in Turkey is definitely to do with a civilization. It's, it's astonishing. It's really astonishing. So, but on the other hand, writing is writing, and um, it's hard to imagine how the world would have been if we never had writing. It created history for a start, and um, holding on to knowledge so people didn't have to discover things all over again every time. There would be written accounts where people could learn and communicate and all sorts of things were recorded as soon as it was possible. Um, even ancient dictionaries on these tablets come to us and they're very informative about vocabulary and um, how they saw the world. So it's a, it's a simple thing if you have a class full of children and you talk about the beginning of writing and you ask them to imagine for a minute um, what the world would be like if there wasn't any writing. No one can imagine it. Um, no books, no newspapers, no letters, no no nothing. Um, it's impossible to imagine it. So it's a very important human achievement to develop writing that languages can be written down and then read by somebody else later on. Yeah. And, and it's incredible uh, that to the, these people, uh, Mesopotamians and Babylonians, had uh, not just created a writing a writing system and were capable of figuring out, hey, we're going to put this into a clay tablet and then leave it somewhere. Um, it was incredible too as to how structured th their yeah. lives were. Their lives were, and they used the writing very freely. People sent letters to one another and things like that. So when they're found on a dig, it's because they got buried, like, for example, um, if there was a destructive layer with it, because of war and all the wars came down and, uh, and everything would be buried in it and or things like that. And that often happens on excavations when they find ancient buildings, what's left of them, they find documents like that, been there all that time. But yeah, you're right. You're right. It's good fun, too. Yeah. Now with the with this writing system with what they're writing you said letters um what were things in their everyday lives that might stand out or be relatable were there things that they were afraid to say or things that they were afraid to write down they would have uh they would dance around it or come up with a different way to say it without saying it um that's a very interesting question on the whole they're rather direct in the sense that um, there are quite a lot of letters to do with um, um, people who've made some arrangement, for example, to sell a load of barley for silver, and the barley has been taken and the silver's never arrived. And um, letters exist of that kind where people say, and um, when are you going to send my barley? Do I have to come around and see you, that kind of thing, or when you're going to pay the money sort of idea, rather abrupt. So I think when they had a point to make, they were rather straightforward. And also they're not um, squeamish about um, sex, because there's a bit of sex in the Epic of Gilgamesh, where his chum Enkidu is seduced by what's known as a harlot. And, um, and they're also... Um, um, uh, incantations and spells to help 
patients to do with uh, people to do with sexual problems like impotence in males there's a whole series of spells and rituals to deal with impotence and they're rather to the point so they weren't they didn't sugar things up if they wanted to say things they said things they didn't have a um i don't think they had a sort of sniggery type thing about sex like um you know as you say going around it or um being embarrassed or something where that such issues come in converse, in literature they're perfectly straightforward and i imagine that they were perfectly straightforward yeah one of the things about them which is the mesopotamians which is not like something one sees in our own lives very often is they were great believers in the principle that you could tell what was going to happen in the future by things that happen to you so for example if you if you're um if you're uh, having dinner and a grasshopper falls off the rafter and lands in your beer um that's the sort of thing that to a babylon would be very ominous it would have a significance and um they collected events of this kind in very long documents um in such a way that they had a reference tool so that when something happened they could look up what had happened in the past so for example if someone had that experience and then the next day their um th their wife was run over by um by a, a, a mad charioteer then they would know that um, that sort of thing had bad consequences and they collected this kind of stuff over hundreds and hundreds of years so that you could for example look up um all the times when a different insect fell into a glass of beer or insects fell into a bowl of soup or into something else so they tried to c collect these things and record them for reference but of course there are hundreds and hundreds of lines like this and they're not all i'm not saying they all happened there must have been a core of omens as, as we call them where a was thought to have had the consequence b and they were all carefully noted and say there was one like a, something falling into your soup then they would think to themselves well you know other things fall into other fluids and they would try and extend the principle as much as possible so that um if, if somebody had a um, uh, uh, um i don't know large beetle falling into a glass of wine they'd be able to find out what it meant you see what i mean they, they extended it and they spent a lot of time doing this there were hundreds and hundreds of documents with lines on about everything you could imagine things in the heavens things that happened to you by chance and then they they did other things as well for example they thought that the uh, you know sheep have livers right and they they had a conception that the liver of a sheep was used by one of the gods in fact the sun god was used as a writing board to give information on the liver of a sheep inside the sheep so that a human specialist could um, slit the throat of the sheep for this ritual remove the liver and examine it for um what it told him and uh this was a very highly developed science which persisted for at least 2000 years and they had um omens drawn from different parts of the liver in a set order so if you looked at it and there was something funny about the gallbladder or something like that then you'd look up the gallbladder thing or if you found holes in the liver or lesions or this or that they were all diagnostic and there were specialists who could look at the liver so for example if a king king was um, annoyed with his neighbor and decided he was going to go and um, have a fight and wanted to know what day of the week to go on that sort of problem then he would get his diviner his specialist to do a sheep's liver job and see what the liver told him about this thing so there might be a sign on the liver which the hindu would say um if the if this funny mark occurs on this part of the liver it means the king will be successful in battle so if he saw a thing like that he would tell the king so it was used as a sort of information outpost and it sounds insane and rather unlikely to be successful but in fact it developed from 
something probably rather elementary to a highly sophisticated system where it was thought to embody um, some structural truth about how the universe worked and the relationship between things that happened in the heavens and things that happened on the earth and the extent to which the gods interfere with or arrange things that happened so it was it was a sort of grid whereby they could tune in if you like to that that sort of matter so this was a very um long running and um significant thing of course the priests who did this probably cooked the sheep afterwards and had it for lunch but it wasn't that was going to be my next question what did they do with the body after <laughs> i think i think that's what they did with it but you know um in italy they uh, they, were, they were the etruscans you should get someone to talk about the etruscans they're quite interesting well they, they found in etruria in italy a model of a sheep liver made of bronze with writing all over it which showed that and that is undoubtedly a, based on a babylonian example that somebody um, must have gone to babylon or encountered a babylonian liver diviner who taught him how to do it and they made a local one with etrurian writing on so that's an example of um uh, something which hardly exists in our world which at one time is very very significant not only being a mesopotamian conception and invention but also it was disseminated outside and other other people adopted it other people took up the same practice and um, of course divination about what's going to happen is not a dead thing in the world a lot of people um practice astrology for example which is a form of divination and many other things as well in different parts of the world there are all sorts of things like people race cockroaches and see who's going to win you know and all that kind of stuff but it is part of the great story of humanity and it's really rather funny but rather fascinating as well it is all of that is and it's interesting to see where how one area so much could, could start from um mm. now i i heard that western astrology originated in this area uh, alexander great. the great took it from the mesopotamians and the romans and the greeks just gave it a fine tuning yep well it's yes fine tuning is perhaps a bit strong but the the, the zodiac was invented in mesopotamia the the, the the path of 12 in the heavens that was a babylonian invention and that was definitely taken by the greeks taken over by the greeks into their own thinking and also um they had a lot of other as i mentioned that they could predict eclipses they had a very scientific approach to astronomy and we can tell that in about the third century bc um greek scholars who had been working on things like this on, on their own went to babylon because they knew that the babylonian or the chaldean astrologers as they called them had experience over many many generations and very extensive records and they went to babylon in order to meet their counterparts and to try and get some idea of all the information they had because the greeks didn't have any data they had great clever minds and they were very thoughtful about phenomena very philosophically alert the clever people who did all that sort of thing but they didn't have observations like the babylonians did over generations and generations of hard facts and that's what they wanted and we know that this is what happened that they interacted with these people they got from them a sort of dose of information quite an extensive dose of information and we, we can prove that this is what happened for one simple reason that the babylonians um, who invented numbers and counting very early on before 3000 bc they did all their counting in 60s see we we do it in tens we have decimal count, counting probably because we have 10 digits but the babylonians the sumerians before them they counted in 60s or sexagesimal counting and um, in, in some respects if you use a base 60 instead of a base 10 it gives you a greater degree of flexibility in calculation anyway the thing that's important about it 
is when the Greeks in the third century went to Babylon and they worked in the libraries with their Babylonian counterparts and they explained and they shared information. Um, all the data that they got from the Babylonians was in 60s, not in 10s. And that is why we have 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour today and 360 degrees in a circle. Because why would you do that? You know, adults never think about it, but sometimes children ask really big questions like, why do we have 60 seconds in a minute? Why is it 60? Well, it's because all the stuff that the Greeks got and they copied things out in, I'm sure, in the libraries and took them home to work on was in this system. And it's it's still with us on a, anybody who has a watch still has 60 minutes on it. It's rather amazing, isn't it? Yeah, the, the time I wish I had kept one of my pocket watches on me to take it out. Um, that would have been a good move. <laughs> but that is, uh, that, that, that's that's great that to know that that's where that came from because they were counting in the 60s. And there's no doubt about it. So um, there was a time when everybody had such a watch on their wrist. And if you said, well, if you look at the watch on your wrist, but if you do that now, people say, I haven't got a watch. I only have a mobile. And it's no good with a mobile because can't tell it just tells you what the time is so it's a whole different thing isn't it yeah good, good. lovely yeah so uh how how are the relations between uh mesopotamia and babylon well babylon and um, so if you have the ancient mesopotamia and you have the babylonians who live in the southern part of the country and the assyrians up in the north so the babylonian half of the country babylon was the capital city of babylonia so Nebuchadnezzar, the famous king in the Bible, he was king in Babylon, which was a, a, a huge city. Like you know, it was just like Manhattan or something in ancient terms, and that's where the big temple, um, stepped temple tower, the ziggurat, um, was in the middle of Babylon, and the king's palace and uh, temples, and it was a huge city. And and that's that's Babylon, and we know the name because the Greeks went there, and the Greeks wrote down the name, and Babylon survived into modern times. And, and because the site, of course, is still there, it's gigantic, as I say, it was like Manhattan, and um, there have been excavations there, um, for a very long period of time, and they found part of Nebuchadnezzar's palace with um, amazing bricks, with lions and bulls. Um, marching along in enameled bricks along the corridor, which is now in Berlin. And um, you, when you, if you ever go to the museum in Berlin and you walk between those columns of animals, you think you could imagine you're going to visit Nebuchadnezzar, who's king of the world, and you hoping like mad that he um, he wasn't cross with you because it would be rather intimidating by the time you got there because the lions are life size and they. Their eyes are huge and their teeth are like this. And you can just imagine walking down there, led by one of the um, king's official. If you hadn't paid up your tribute like a good king and you, you've been a bit naughty, you'd probably be shaking with fear by the time you got in front of Nebuchadnezzar, which is presumably the idea. Oh, my. Yeah, that's that's a new take on that. I remember in Boston when I was going to school, I was able to go into the Museum of Fine Arts for free for being a student. Yep. And uh, I, I got to walk through uh, the Mesopotamia and Babylon section. Um, Rob, exactly. it was, yeah, it was a small room, and they actually had a couple of the Anunnaki statue uh, or carvings, stone carvings, for probably about as tall as the the door right. frame. Yes. And then they had a couple of these large uh, bull and uh, lion statues, and, and these things were massive, huge. And also, you know, when they had those sculptures on the wall with, with those divine figures standing flat along the wall, well, in in original terms, um, they of course they didn't have electric light. Obviously, they had oil lamps and things like that. And if you walk down the passages of the of the palace at night, um, you'd have a lamp with you. But so as you got near, these things would come out of the wall shadowy 
And then as you went past, they'd recede into the dark. And that's like something, you know, when you're a kid, when you have these ideas in your mind, it must have been like that. It was never bright light like it is in the museum where you can see everything. It was only if you went up to it with your lamp to examine it carefully. So that, that's, a, that's an interesting thought, I think. Or if the moon was full. <laughs> yes, or if the moon was there. Yes, they were always looking out for the, the new moon. It was a very important time, so. Yeah. Well, I'm glad yeah. you went there to see. When you went there when you were a boy or a student, made an impression on your mind. That's the exact point. Very good. See? But yeah. I'm going to Boston. Yeah. Yeah. So it was. Now, now I want to go back, see it all over again. Yeah, it's worth You have to come and see the British Museum or um, there's some stuff in Chicago or um, where else is there? Philadelphia, they have interesting things. And they have very good museums. Of, 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 of extraordinary things that would come out of the ground. Yeah, hopefully, course, hopefully 2024, I, I will be able to take a trip back to the United Kingdom and uh, yeah. visit everyone that I've I've been interviewing over the last year. Now, can you give me an idea too about the geography at the time? Was it, uh, it was, it was ancient Iraq at this time very much like a desert, like it is well, today or? Well, it's, it's, it's mixed in the South. Um, there's a lot of desert now and there was then but they had the massive rivers of Euphrates and Tigris which come down from the far north and the, the water is very pure and with nutrients and they found out very early how to take one of the branches of the river and make canals off it and smaller canals off it and they learned how to harness the water to irrigate the land and the minute you do that it comes green and uh, next minute you've got luxuriant growth and everything and they were brilliant at doing it so some of the ancient cities you know um, it's a funny matter but in I Iraq when you travel around you see a sort of great mound in the horizon in many directions and they're not natural they are where they're ancient sites where people lived for such a long time, sometimes different populations on top of another, gradually, gradually it built up. So it's a great archaeological mass of stuff. And sometimes these desert, these, these, these mounds where people lived, ancient cities, are completely desert all around today. But when they were populated, they must have had canals running and trees and luxurious and so when the man stops doing it, it resorts, it, it stays, it goes back to a desert. Um, but in the north of Iraq, it's quite different. It's green and luxuriant and it's a different landscape. So there's a great deal of contrast between it. But the, the, the clever thing about the Sumerians who lived in the south was they really knew how to utilize their environment to the best possible way. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is incredible. It's interesting. It, yeah, very interesting. Very, very like that's how they were able to work the land in that sense. That that really is remarkable. The human ingenuity. Um, so uh, I guess I might make this the second to last question. Um, <laughs> what, what other story stories do we have? Anything beyond the Enuma Elish or the Epic of Gilgamesh in terms of the stories or the mythos? Uh, translated within the uh, ancient beliefs. Well, those those are the most famous things and they're best preserved because Gilgamesh has, as I said, 12 whole tablets of stuff and the creation epic has seven tablets of stuff. So there's a lot of lines and because so many people have been interested in them, lots of bits have been identified and sometimes fragments are joined on and things like that. So um, they are the most accessible texts, they're best preserved and they're translated into modern languages. There are other things as well. There's quite a lot of stories in Sumerian um, uh, which have been translated in, there, there are sort of collections of literature in translation. And um, they didn't have stories in the sense of um, modern stories. Many of them are mythological, if, if you want to call them mythological, or about ancient kings. But I'm not so sure about this word mythology, because um, in the modern world, 
um, myth and mythology carries with it the idea that something isn't true. You say the myth of this or, you know, that sort of idea. Someone has uh, makes a suggestion. It's just a myth. So that it's not something you should credit. But that doesn't apply at all to ancient mythology. And it's, I think for, for in modern terms, it's not the best word to use. But I think this, that um, they had a good sense of history because they um, they kept the royal inscriptions of their kings and they made lists of kings and how many years they reigned, things like that. So they could look them up and um, the fathers and sons and grandsons and, and how many years they had. And it's a very systematic. So they had the backbone of history back to the, quite early on in their time in a clear way. And then before that, there was a period without history and then of course there was the great flood which went over and there was a time before the flood but what we call mythology i think was what they thought there was their best idea of their ancient history i think they it, it wasn't um made up sort of thing it wasn't an artificial thing it was traditional stories from early times as, as people understood them or as they and they transmitted them and they developed them but they weren't um it's not that people believed them or didn't believe them they in in the sense of in the modern sense it was just part of their traditional inheritance from something like that they were taken for granted those stories they're part of human psychology and as a res partly as a result of storytellers i think as i was explaining before who because you know people who can talk out like actors if an actor reads something people are completely silent if a normal person reads something it's just boring because they don't know how to um project material in a way that commands attention and i'm sure with traditional storytellers but this was the same thing that they had down to a fine art the way of um t taking their audience with them and they'd all <gasps> like that when they and it was something frightening and you know and and, and and so these stories were from childhood and adulthood they were part of their their apparatus part of their apparatus so not all of them were written down of course but we can see with Gilgamesh, for example, which is so long, that what was originally separate tales were worked together into one big narrative before they had written history, when they had the dates. But I mean, they knew, for example, how um, very early, how long very early kings ruled and what their son was called and what their grandson was called. They had because they collected all these uh, historical accounts. I'm King so and so. They never threw anything away, and they made them into a sort of historical structure. So they had to have some idea of what existed before the structured history. That, that That's how that works, I think. Mm. Yes, yes, uh, that really is. And um, yeah, so our, our last question, do you have a message for future generations? Well, my message to future generations is this, that um, if you, just, if you um, spend any time looking into this sort of resource, as I say, what comes out of it, at least to my mind, is that the people there are like people today and their lives are subjected to the same things that people are today and they dealt with them as best they could as people do today. So there's a great kinship um, to be derived from looking at these members of the human race from a much earlier time um, because it's reassuring in a sense that um, we're all in the same boat. But there's another side to the thing that um, the more people know about what's happened in the past, the more intelligently they can deal with the future. So, for example, if you have any kind of philosophical leaning, um, it is very difficult to imagine that it is still the case in the world that warfare goes on. And boy, does it go on and it's going on now. And you would think that with all the things that have happened, everybody would know that warfare and killing is not the answer to anything you would think that would be too obvious for words but they've never learned the lesson and the thing is that the human race never ever profits from its own history it never learns anything from its own history there are no lessons that people say whatever you do whatever we're going to do we're never going to have another war because if everybody said that then there wouldn't be any 
And the politicians who can, oh, it's time we had a war, it's a good idea, or it's to do with commerce, or it's to do with this, that, and the other, is wicked. It's a wicked thing. And the tragedy of the human race, as far as I understand it, is it's never, ever profited from its own history. And that is something which we should do. Like when you um, put the wrong person to be president of the United States, for example, theoretically speaking, what a disaster it is for everybody. And if you have a warmonger in charge of a state and absolute power, what a disaster it is for everybody. These people in the world are like microbes. We know how to deal with microbes. We invent things to get rid of viruses. They are a kind of virus. And they make everybody else's life unhappy. Everybody else's life unhappy. So this is a complete imbalance and madness in the world. And I think if you find out about all the kings that died of poison and in bed, and all the people who lived in the countryside in were farmers and priests and nuns and all these people who got around with their lives and then there was a plague and a war and flu. It's a terrible thing how vulnerable human beings are. And it, it's one of the things that impresses upon it, me, knowing about all this early stuff, is that it, it, although the human beings haven't changed, nor has their way of preventing the things that could be prevented changed. Thank you, Dr. Finkel. It's a pleasure. I'm glad to meet you.